This is Fireside Craps, Episode 1, October 15th, 2021. I'm your host, John Kokus from the YouTube channel Pro Craps. So thankful that you're here to join me on this first episode of our podcast. Really excited to get going here. Podcast is going to be a little different than the YouTube channel, I can tell you that. The YouTube channel obviously is more based on strategy and teaching and that sort of thing. The podcast, more opinion based for sure. We've got a lot of really fun segments planned. And I think this first episode, we're going to kind of take a tour around the podcast. I'll give you a sense of what we're going to cover in each episode and you know, do a little bit of content here. But really, my goal is to get to know you and to have you get to know me a little better as well. So uh, more of that to come here. But before we get started, none of this happens, of course, without our sponsors and the folks that make this possible. So let's break for a minute here, hear from our sponsors, and I'll join you right back on the other side kick things off here with a little story time with John. So I'll use this segment during the podcast here really to tell you just general fun, cool, whatever gambling stories. I thought the first episode, I'll tell you a couple short stories, but really it's about meeting my family. And because most of my stories are going to involve the family and I thought it'd be kind of cool to meet them through a, through a couple of, of interesting little tidbits here. So for me, gambling starts early because when I was younger, my, my, my parents were divorced and I got to hang out with my dad every other weekend, my mom every other weekend, and both families did probably what your family did, which is play family poker. I mean, we did, you know, my mom's side was, you know, typical five card stud and, and follow the queen and baseball and all the different poker games that we played for pennies and just for fun all weekend. It was my mom and my dad and my grandparents and the aunts and it was a, a great time. On my dad's side of the family, it was a little more serious. And I remember those weekends well because it's, it's a big Greek family and we'd go up there and of course my grandmother would load us up with all the food and all the men would go into the basement either at the house or at the church and the church games were where it was at. The church games were, were for the big money. But I remember going down there and it's stinking to high heaven, like all the cigarettes and the cigars and just, you know, my uncles and, and it was cool because I could sit on my dad's lap or next to him and he'd let me bet his quarters for him and dollars when the, when the stakes got higher. It was just super cool to be down there with the guys, you know, as a eight year old kid. And I can still like I can still smell the smoke. And I'm sure if you think back to when you were in that same spot with your parents or grandparents, that's that's dirty ass ashtray smell. I still love the smell. I mean, I'm I'm a former smoker and I'm a former smoker who wishes he was still a smoker. I'd love the smell of it. And I think from those early days, it's, it's maybe that's why I started smoking. I don't know. Anyway, great memories of that. And as I got older, my mom and dad moved, my mom, my stepdad moved down to South Jersey, really far South Jersey, near Atlantic City. And they got going to the casino quite a bit. And, you know, on the weekends, my brother and I were 13 to 15 years old or so, and they would take us out with them for the weekend. It was great. My parents were pretty good, I think, uh, big gamblers. And we always had a free room. So my brother Jeff and I would always be up in the room as teenagers and again, Atlantic City Boardwalk in those days wasn't the shithole that it is today. Back then, it was actually kind of a cool place to be for a kid. So I remember walking the boards with Jeff, and my parents would load us up with money. They would just throw us 20s and just for quarters and food and that kind of thing. We just walk the boards, get on the beach, you know, looking for girls, that kind of thing, and just kind of doing our thing as 15-year-old kids on the Atlantic City Boardwalk. And... I started to get the bug. My brother never got the bug, but I got the bug. And I wanted to know what was going on. And my dad and mom uh, at that time would just, you know, after the weekend's over, or even in the room sometimes, they would teach me blackjack. And I learned blackjack and baccarat from my dad. Some basic strategy, of course, and uh, the baccarat betting strategy that I still to this day use that same strategy that, that he taught me way back then. But I remember almost every weekend being at the casino with them as a young kid and and seeing all the shows. Like we saw everybody. I mean, Wayne Newton and Count Basie and just like, you name it, whoever came in Atlantic City in the 80s, we were seeing them. It was awesome. Good memories now. Back when I was a kid, you know, it wasn't my kind of music, of course, but it was just now I can look back and go, wow, I saw Count Basie in the second row. Um, I saw Rich Little. It was just pretty cool stuff. Anyway, learning blackjack and, and baccarat was a cool thing. My dad bought the John Patrick VHS collection and had me watch those things, kind of prepping me for when I was going to be 21. And I watched them all, and I just committed all that stuff to memory. I still, to this day, channel John Patrick the, in the way that I do everything. But I remember turning 21, going to the casino, 
and trying all the games. Like I, I brought, you know, my birthday money with me and I went and tried every game for a hundred bucks just to kind of, and I lost my ass, but it was cool just to get out there and sort of try it for real at a, at a casino and kind of break that fear of like that, you know what I mean? That first fear that you get at the first time at a table. And I broke that at a young age. It was kind of cool to get out there and do that. But fast forward a little bit, you know, I wasn't the luckiest player. You know, I always had to work for it. I'm glad I watched the Patrick videos because without him, I never would know what the hell I'm doing. Um, he taught me more than my dad could. My dad and mom taught me feel. When I played blackjack with them live, um, my mom is actually the nightmare person that yells at people when they get stuff wrong. That's mom. And she and my dad would actually play first base and, and, and last base on the, on, the, on the blackjack table. He'd be in the front, she'd be in the back, and he'd make the initial bet. She would track everybody's move. And even if you screwed up across the thing, she would know who screwed up, what card should have been pulled, what, and she would either stand or hit and hit multiple times, if, even if she wasn't supposed to from basic strategy, to keep the shoe right. Because she knew that if you were supposed to hit and you didn't, and this guy hit twice and he shouldn't have, that the shoe was off by one. And she would make the right move and kind of keep things standard. Just an amazing head for the game. And the two of them did really, really, and I, I watched them for hours. And I learned a lot from that. And I, I still, to this day, think when I go to the tables, just about that. I mean, I still can remember just the, the theory behind keeping the shoe legitimate in blackjack, uh, keeping the shoe kind of straight. And in craps, I look at things the same way. I'm like, I'm always making that move three moves ahead. And I'm looking, um, my, the way I do strategies is kind of based on that blackjack day, um, the blackjack days where I was really kind of trying to channel my mom and think ahead, 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 what needs to happen, what should have happened, and how can we fix it? if it goes south. And that's the way that I still play craps. But anyway, I, I moved out to Washington. Long story short, I moved to Washington. I'll tell you why some other day. But I met my wife, my future wife, and we ended up getting married and moving back to New Jersey. And this is going to be in like 1993, four-ish. I was probably 23, 24. And my wife also, like everybody else, you know, huge family poker player and just the whole family was all about poker every weekend. And every time I, I would hang out with her and her family, we played games or poker or something, and it was just kind of the, the social aspect of that family. It was, just, it was really cool, good way for me to kind of meld right into them, and it, it fit pretty well. Well, we go back to Jersey after we got married, and we introduced Kathy to the world of the casino, and um, I always knew she was lucky from the family poker game. She always did really good. I didn't realize how lucky she was until we got to the casinos, and she has this way about her where she hits, man. She, I mean, she hits, she hits all the time. She's really a lucky, lucky player. It's really cool to watch. And, you know, she'll hit one big one and then she'll kind of grind through and maybe, you know, maybe she'll burn it, but she always seems to, to grab one. And she just gravitated towards, I know you know what I'm talking about, the old school kind of video poker, the, the jacks are better poker machine. She loves those things. My dad and mom got her into playing that and they, and they theorized. And my, my mom and dad had kind of switched off a of blackjack by this time and they were doing a lot more video poker and other things and she just fell in love with it and she's so lucky and it was cool because on the weekends when we first moved back to jersey we were pretty poor we just got married and we would spend the weekends visiting my my parents and going to ac and doing the thing and you know i spent probably two years every weekend in ac um and the thing is my my wife because she plays video poker and my parents played video poker they could play for freaking hours i mean like six seven hours they could play and I don't like slot machines. I do not like a computer telling me if I win or not. So I like to have some measure of control. So, you know, blackjack, roulette, whatever. I, I, I played all these games, but, you know, you can't play roulette for eight hours. You can't play blackjack for eight hours. Eventually, the game gets you. There's a house edge, and it gets you. Um, I learned how to play craps because I figured out early, especially from watching Patrick, how to grind. I learned how to grind early because... I needed strategies that would let me last for six, seven, eight hours while they were all playing their slots, waiting for dinner, basically. So a lot of my grinder strategies that I show on my YouTube channel are based on some of that those days, right? They weren't designed to make me a ton of money. It was designed to make me last and enjoy my night while they were enjoying theirs. So I used to play craps alone while the three of them would go play slots. And that's how I got to where, that's how I kind of, derived my strategies from. Anyway, Kathy 
ridiculously lucky. We went to, I'm going to fast forward you a little bit. We went to Vegas one year for her birthday. I think it was her birthday. Maybe it was, I, I, I think it was her birthday. And this is back in probably 05 or so, roughly around there. Um, my son was six or seven years old. He's 23 now. So this is going back a few years. And we were in Vegas. We were staying at Harris. She was playing at the Casino Royale, which I love that casino. Too bad they don't have craps there anymore. It's unfortunate. But she's playing at the Royale. I'm down the strip. I think I was maybe at Mandalay Bay or New York, New York. Or so. I was down way a ways away. And she's doing her thing, and I'm doing my thing over here. And I get this text. And you got to remember, in those days, the phones were flip phones, right? Those of you who are old enough to remember the flip phone was crap, right? The little screen was like a little tiny square. It was not very clear. And you had a text with the, with the numbers. Remember that? So anyway, I get this text that says, get over here, I need help. And I'm like, oh shit, okay. Yeah. I'm like, are you okay? And she's like, yes. And she sends me a picture. And the picture, you could barely see it. And But I could tell that it was a slot machine picture. I'm like, oh, she must have won. I'm like, how much did you win? She says, enough. And I'm like, okay. So I cash out, I get to the cab, and I'm driving down with the cab. There was no Uber then. There was no train then. Hit the cab, you know, r ripping it down to the Royale. And I get another text from her that says, hurry the hell up. And I'm like, I'm trying. And she sends me the picture of the slot machine, right? So, you know, I finally get there. It takes, you know, whatever it takes to get there. And I roll into the place. And she's sitting there at the end of this row of, of, of poker machines. And lights are going off. And there's like three people standing around her. Well, come to find out she's got inside of the machine she's playing that she won on and the one next to it both have those little like whatever they're called those like plastic things that they put into the coin slot so you couldn't play it again while she was waiting for the hand pay on the first one the first four thousand bucks she put a hundred bucks in the machine next to it just to burn time and hit that one for another freaking four thousand bucks so she's sitting there getting paid 8k from the Casino Royale, they got the whole place basically shut down. It's a whole thing because two machines side by side within five minutes of each other hit for the same, you know, five deuces. And here comes old John, you know, running in there. And I'm like, what are we doing, you know? And so they, of course, after all said and done, they hand pay us. We put the money in her purse. We zip her purse up. I put the purse on around my neck, so I'm carrying it. I got both hands wrapped around it. And this is our first time in Vegas, you know, and I'm walking up the strip with a pocketbook essentially, you know, getting, you know, into our hotel room and we're up there giggling like school kids. I'm like, oh my God, we just, you know, we just hit the lottery. Again, brand new married couple here, right? We won a little bit of money, but never nothing like that. And I'm like, I got to figure out how to use the safe. You know, we're trying to figure the safe out. And she, she goes, John, John, check this out. Money all over the bed, of course, right? That's what you do. You, you lay it all over the bed. We jump into the money, take a picture of it. And I send it to my buddy, my buddy Bruce. Now, while we're here at Vegas, um, Bruce and I coach baseball together for years. And this is our, this is our first year. We just met him. And our, my son is, like I said, seven or eight years old. He's, he's still playing basically coach pitch baseball. And Bruce is doing the all-star thing. I mean, he and I coached the team, but I was in Vegas and he was picking the team. Anyway, he's picking the team. We're writing back and forth. How's it going? Whatever. I send him a picture of, of, of the bed. And again, it's a cell phone, flip phone, crappy ass picture of me and her on the bed with all this money. He says, dude, what is that? And I'm like, that's tuition for this year. <laughs> Our kids went to a private school and um, we just like basically in one night paid for the whole year, which was fantastic. It was really pretty cool. Um, funny, funny story. Uh, and that and that was like, again, early in our marriage. Um, I, like I said, Zach was probably seven years old and we had won a little bit like that in, in AC a few times, but never, never 8K in 10 minutes like that. So... Anyway, th this past year, we were at um, a, a couple of other ones for you. We were at for our anniversary, and I've told this story before on the YouTube channel on the Karma and Craps episode. You should watch that. We go out for our anniversary, and this is our, geez, our 27th anniversary this year. And we're playing, and we, we walk into our local casino. You know, we both get a, a, a shot. We do a, you know, happy anniversary, and then we just kind of go our separate ways like we do. I'm off to the craps table. She goes and hunts down the poker machine, of course. I'm at the craps table for maybe five minutes. Like I had, I, and I'll tell you another story. I was waiting to buy in, you know, and for the first time in my life, I watched a guy hit the ATS. I've, I've been playing craps forever. I've never seen it get hit in person. I'm waiting to buy into this damn table and this guy freaking hits it. Um, you know, I couldn't get in anyway because there was two people deep waiting, but it was just like, of course, you know, of course he hits it while I'm watching. 
Anyway, I finally get to the table. Maybe about 15 minutes have gone by when two people get up after he sevens out and they all cashed out and buggied. I hit the table, buy in, maybe a person shoots and here comes a text from Kathy. Happy anniversary to me. You know, and again, picture of the screen, 750 bucks, right? Just we're in a casino, like 20 minutes, maybe, maybe a half an hour at best. So I'm like, great. And I'm like, you know, I, I need a few minutes. <laughs> so I played for probably an hour or so. The story of my night is actually a really good one. You watch that YouTube episode to hear the whole thing. But long story short, it was a great night for me at the craps table. We go off to dinner and, you know, it, it was just, a, a, again, typical Kathy. Walk in the casino, six minutes later, she wins. And even a month ago, we went to Phoenix to visit my friend Bruce, the baseball coach. And we're down there and just, you know, on a whim, just, hey, let's go visit Bruce for a weekend kind of thing. And, you know, as of the, the taping of this episode, it's October 13th, 2021. Uh, Arizona has just now gotten craps approved. So I'm like, hey, we guys should go, go check the craps tables out and see if they've got them running yet. And so one night that we're down there, we all pile into the car and go to the casino. Well, there's a roll to win table, which I really am dying to play. And it was still being built. So it wasn't actually on yet, but it was, all the parts were there. And there was no live craps yet. So we, you know, Bruce and I kind of do a little tour and cats with us. And we go back out to the back of the casino. There's a little roll to win section. So we're playing roll to win stadium craps for a few minutes. And Kat was like, well, you know, I'm going to go. I'm going to go try and find the bathroom. Now, we had just eaten dinner downstairs. At the, it was good food, by the way. Ate dinner. She's like, I'm going to go find me a bathroom. And I'm like, cool, see you later. And, you know, whatever. And I'm, I'm teaching Bruce how the Iron Cross. I'm playing like a $1 Iron Cross, like, you know, two, two dollars in the five, six, and eight, and a dollar in the field just to try and, you know, burn some time on this little bubble crafts machine. I think the thing rolled twice. Here comes a text. Just popped a grand, right? She's another picture of a screen. She wants a thousand bucks. And I write back, like, did you even get to the bathroom? She's like, no, I just, I saw the, the bank of machines on the way and I just sat down and threw some money in. And, you know, four or five spins later, she, she hits the, hits for a grand. So that's, again, typical Kathy. Love playing with her because she's, she's A, a ton of fun. B, she's wickedly lucky. And I'm not. I'm, I'm a worker, man. You watch me play here at home um, on the channel and I work, man. My strategies are, are made to work. Um, I'm not a home run hitter. She definitely is a home run hitter. My son got the got the bug from us, and he's just as lucky as she is. We were after he moved. He graduated college and he moved to a town in Oregon. We went down to visit him, and he and I went to the casino to play craps. And again, I'm waiting to get on the table. We had this little tiny table there, and first spot opens up. I think go ahead and take it, Zach, and he jumps on. Table's full, so I wait to get on the table, and um, I'm waiting, and I'm waiting, and this this person um, is rolling. And for whatever reason, in mid-roll, the guy next to the stick colors up and leaves, which you don't see that very often. Like, great, so I walk up to the table, I have my money out, but I'm not going to be that guy, right? We all know the etiquette. You're not going to buy in mid-roll. So I wait, and I wait, and I wait. I'm standing there like an idiot with my money in my hand, and this guy goes off for like freaking 40 rolls, right? 40 whatever he rolls. Zach's playing the Iron Cross. He starts out at table minimum. He's using his field to press his place best. He's pressing the place best with himself. He's doing all the thing. Before you know it, this guy sevens out like an hour and a half later, whatever it was. Zach's got like 750 bucks. I haven't even bought in yet, right? And he's like, he's, you know, tickled as a pig and shit. He's loving life. I buy in and, you know, I'm like, cool, let's go. You know, and I was trying, I forget, I think I was doing the cum ladder that day. And I'm just like, let's get rolling here. Well, the table goes to complete shit. Like I lose... I donate my 300 bucks in like 20 minutes. Like it's just gone. Like it, it was such a bad table. I couldn't catch dark side. I couldn't catch light side. I couldn't get nothing. The first guy that sevens out, Zach cashes up, right? And he's watching me and laughing his ass off because dad's, you know, dad with the YouTube channel is getting his butt kicked and he just rolled up and won like his mom did, which I think is fantastic. It, it's nothing better than watching your family a, enjoy the things that you enjoy. I think sharing that with them is badass and awesome. And watching them win, even better. You know, I don't win every time. I win most of the time, but not every time. And when I, when I don't, I just really get a charge out of watching them play. And they're just so fun. And they're so lucky. And it just, it's just fun to watch. Like, I don't know, man. It's just like seeing somebody's face when they, when they hit a big one, especially when it's their first big one. It just, it's super, super cool. It never goes away. Um, it's just the high that you keep chasing. So anyway, that's a little bit of, uh, 
a little bit of my family, a little bit of history. As I talk about Zach and Kat and you know other folks in, in the family as we go along through these stories, maybe now you have a little bit of, of a mental picture of, of who they are and, and, and how they play and stuff. So this segment, by the way, if, if you have your own story, share it with me. I know all of you have been playing for a long time. And if you've got a great story, man, I'd love to hear it. If you go to our website at firesidecraps.com, there's a button there that says leave us a message. You can click the button and you can just talk in your computer speakers and just give me a voicemail. And if it's a great story, I can play your voicemail and play it live here. We'll hear it all together. Otherwise, I can kind of paraphrase for you and, and share it with everybody. But I know that there are so many good stories out there. I'd love to hear yours. So share it with us at firesidecraps.com. You are a douchebag. <laughs> yeah, there are, there are so many douchey things you can do at a craps table. And uh, I want to use this segment to really talk through some of that with you. Today, we're going to talk about don't betters. There are so many douchey don't betters out there. And if you're one of them, listen up. Okay, let's talk about it. The thing about the don't, the don't, or the dark side is this. For some reason, and there's a stigma about it. And I can tell you this. When I first learned how to play craps, I was taught to play by a don't player who said to me, the way you find a table is to look at the hook. Said, look at the hook look for black. If you see black around the hook, black chips, you know that's a that's a great table for you, right? Look for the black chips, smell the cigar smoke. There's always some old fart back there smoking a cigar, got his black chips, and you know that's the table for you on the don't side. And I learned in an early age to kind of scout that out a little bit. And again, that's part of the grind that I've learned. And the one thing I noticed about that group, though, is that the don't players at the hook tend to be, for some reason, a little bit cranky, right? A bunch of old SOBs back there really not enjoying the game. They're just kind of there plotting their time, making their money. And, you know, I can be a jerk sometimes too, right? I'm, I can be a little bit sour, but I'm there for two reasons, right? And I, I say this all the time. I'm, I go to the casino t now. Um, I'm there on a business trip, right? I'm there to make a withdrawal. I'm not there to gamble. But while I'm there, I'm sure it's all going to have some fun. I'm not going there to be a sourpuss. And, the guys on the don't that are in the back of the table, just whatever, man, just being, being sour, being salty. I've seen them aim for people's chips to try and knock their chip stacks down. I've seen them purposefully. And again, I know you want to win the seven, right? But I've seen them do things that cause sevens and over celebrating the win. Now you're allowed to celebrate. There's no reason I'll never tell you not to celebrate a win, right? It's cool when you win, but kind of forcing it and rubbing somebody's face in it when you tip when when the casino takes their money and remember the seven wins like one person at the table money and it takes 15 people's money away you know we're all playing this game for the same reason and i look at it like it ain't poker right this ain't a poker game where i'm trying to take your money this is we're all trying to take casino money so to me like if anybody's taking their money we should all be happy about that so if i'm on the don't and somebody hits a point or somebody's ripping, I don't care. If they roll 35 rolls and I'm on the don't pass, cool. I hope everybody wins a bunch of money. That's amazing. Take their money. And when it's seven comes, it's my turn. And I think we should look at it that way. But being one of those salty-ass don't players that's either A, over-celebrating, or B, trying um, to take people's money or cause them to lose and then rubbing it in their face, which I see all too often, don't be that guy. Don't be a dickhead. Just play your game and do your thing. And again... Craps is this amazing game, right? It's a social game. Why would you go to a table and just crinkle up into a folded up little ball and just be a sourpuss all night? Have fun. Most of the time when you play the don't purely, you're looking for the spot at the hook because you're going to play the don't come and everything. And frankly, you're trying to get out of people's way who are doing the other thing. That dealer back there, why not chat him up? Why not chat up the person next to you? The don't player is doing no work. Right, everybody else is figuring out their presses and they're working hard on their inside bets and whatever else. As a don't player, you're pretty much got your bet set. You're sitting there waiting for that seven. You're the ideal person to help out the new person that showed up, that's a little bit drunk, got their girlfriend, and teach them how to play. You're the perfect person to do that to explain the game while there's a bunch of craziness going on. You're not part of the crazy. Be an ambassador. Grow the game. What I don't want to see is the the game of crap shrink because we're aging, right? I'm not seeing a lot of young people. I'm not seeing a lot of females, women playing craps. 
I don't want to see the game shrink. I don't want to see casinos closing down tables in favor of the electric tables. I want the energy at a table. And if you're a don't player, you can bring energy. You can talk. You can chat it up. You can have fun as a don't player. And if you approach it as, hey, I'm going to make my money and I'm not going to be an asshole, even better, you have a, a chance to make it good for somebody. So don't be a don't be a douchebag if you're a don't player. And the same thing will hold true. I will do this segment again. And I'll talk about the douchebag do betters because the right side betters can be just as, if not more, douchey than don't better. So uh, I'll close this with this. If you see something, say something. And this goes true for every douchey thing you see at a table. You have my permission. Tell them John told you it's okay to put an end to it. Okay. You see somebody dropping their hand in for a late bet, tell them, let the guy throw, please. If you see somebody being a jerk and over celebrating, just give him the eye. You can say something. It's cool. It's our game. It's our game. Let's make it the game we want it to be. So don't just sit there and bitch to yourself or bitch to your wife later or give the dealer the roll the eye roll. Say something, right? We have a chance to to fix our own game and to start with fixing ourselves. And that's kind of my that's my rant for the week here. So if you have seen douchey behavior, and I know you have, you've got a great story. Again, leave me a voicemail. Go to firesidecrafts.com, hit the message button, give me your best douchebag story, and I'm sure we can fill entire episodes with your amazing stories of people being jerky at tables. It actually is some of the funniest things. When I watch some of these other channels, Sin City Living, for example, they can be a little salty sometimes, but I think hearing the stories from dealers about the douches that show up there, I think it's pretty fun. So share with me your, your favorite douchebag at a table story at firesidecraps.com. I'd love to incorporate that into a future episode. Every episode of Fireside Craps is brought to you in part by Craps Nation. And what I want to do is, is highlight a Craps Nation member every episode because Craps Nation really stands for what I stand for, which is to grow the game of craps in any number of ways. There's so many YouTubers and just general enthusiasts as part of Craps Nation, and they brought me in under their wing, to, so to speak, and helped me kind of have the confidence to, to do a podcast like this, as well as the YouTube channel. So... To that end, I want to call out one Craps Nation member today, and that's Dave Carlin at Same Bet. Dave has an instrumental role in not only my channel, my YouTube channel, but this podcast in general. Dave, talking craps for me was always must-see TV. Like I would stop the presses and watch that. He was one of the first people that I ever actually hit the notification bell for because they didn't want to miss an episode. Dave's uh, production quality his ability to interview people and just be interesting and was just amazing. And his ability to kind of run the show, like he's got the two, the, the two talking heads, he's got the, the words on the bottom, he just has this smooth, smooth delivery and presentation, it's awesome. And you know, I knew he was part of what Craps Nation is. I didn't know what Craps Nation was. I'd seen Craps Nation on various YouTube channels, but I didn't know what it was, but I knew Dave was a part of it. So I emailed him and said, hey, you don't know me from Adam. I'm John. I have a new channel called Pro Craps, and I'm curious, how do I now get into Craps Nation? Because I thought you had to be a channel to be in. And he's like, no, 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 it's not a club like that. It's anybody can be in Craps Nation. Just here's the information. He got me into the fold and introduced the people, and, you know, that's it. Bob's your uncle. I'm part of Craps Nation. And then he wrote me back maybe an hour, maybe two hours later, and said, hey, I just watched your video. Um, you've really got something here. I'd love to have you on the show sometime. Would you be interested? And I'm like, would I be interested? I've got four followers, right? One of them is my son. One of them is me. Yes. I mean, of course I'm interested in being on your show and growing the channel. And I, I was just shocked that Dave, of all people, Dave wanted me on his show. And it just, it fires you up, right? When, when you get kind of an internal call out like that from somebody who you respect that says something and it gave me the the kind of the wherewithal and the impetus i guess to go and do it so that made me film two more videos and add cocktails and craps live shows and add more frequent coffee and craps so i wanted to to have a channel worthy of being on his show by the time our episode was was to air so yeah dave sets the bar uh dave is to me along with jeremy 
and El Toro and Greg and, and some of the other folks that I, you know I, I, I know and love so well, Dave is craps royalty to me. And the, the fact that he considered me as a guest on his show, off the charts. And again, that to me does two things. One, it fires you up to do it to be worthy of it, I suppose. But also there's a little bit of accountability there. And you're like, you know, yeah, now there's pressure. Now there's pressure to perform and raise my standard because I wanted my production quality to be to his standard. And, you know, I look at guys like Jeff at Mid Atlantic who has great production quality and Greg at 555 with great storytelling. These are standards that you want to hit. And as a producer, as a content creator, as a YouTuber, and now as a, as a podcaster, when you find folks that have raised the bar so high, you've got to find ways to, to sort of match that. So if you haven't had a chance yet to go and visit Dave's channel, highly recommend it. It's still must-see TV. His interviews are fantastic. Get back in there and watch Dave's channel. Subscribe to him and uh, be a part of, of Talking Craps and the forthcoming Same Bet show that he's got planned. So uh, thanks again, Dave, and uh, we'll see you, see you online. What are we saying no to in this episode? Crapless craps. And to be honest with you, crapless craps is crap. It's garbage. I know there are people out there that I just pissed off that love it. I couldn't hate anything more than crapless craps. It's just another reason, you know, another thing. The casinos roll out a new game, not because it gives you any advantage. It gives them more of an advantage. Crapless craps takes away the don't. Now, you know that I'm a don't player. So clearly when they eliminate me from the game, that pisses me off a little bit. But frankly, the don't is part of the game. And they removed an entire part of the game of craps. And what they replaced it with is shit. I mean, honest to God, placing the 12 or the 3, even worse, what if you're a come better and your come bet moves to the freaking 3 or the 11? You got no shot of winning that bet. Why would you put odds on that? People will, will do it. Um, it's a ridiculous game. It's a carnival game to me. And even worse, every casino that I've seen crapless craps in, the tables are 14 to 16 feet long. The one at New York, New York, and Vegas is a 16-foot table. They've got a trampoline on a circuit. You can't keep the dice on the table. It's just a garbage game. And frankly, they can stuff it. I'm never playing that game. You shouldn't play it either. The thing is, I want to grow the game of crafts. I don't want to grow it in a crappy way. I don't want crapless crafts to take over. I don't want more stadium crafts. I don't want more bubble crafts. I want more legit, regular crafts tables. The only way that crap like this goes away is if we as a group stop playing it. Don't frequent things you don't like. Don't head to the crapless craps table. I know there are strategies that you can use to win. I know that you can place your inside bets and it's just like a regular table. But again, if you encourage bad behavior, you're going to get more of it. And the casinos will just keep on rolling it out there. They'll, they'll, they'll ruin something else in this game. If you let them get away with crapless craps, God only knows what's coming next. Just say no to crapless craps, please. Trust me on this. If we let that game succeed, they'll make worse games to follow it. And before you know it, regular craps as we know it is going to be gone. We can't let that happen. Just say no to crapless craps, please. What's trending in the game of craps? I think $25 tables are trending. And that's where I think we're headed. Now, I know that people, I've talked to people and they disagree with me, but I'm right on this one. Post-COVID, what's happened is the $5 table has just gone the way of the dodo. There's just no more of them. There's one or two in Vegas that people will flock to. Ellis Island's one. Maybe another off-strip casino. Maybe something downtown at 3 in the morning on a Wednesday. Locally, my casinos here are still 5 and $10. But even the $10 table is kind of going away. you got to get lucky to find one of those on the Strip in Atlantic City for sure. $15 tables, they're a thing. I just don't like the math of that. And what I see a lot more of is $25 tables. They're just everywhere. And the problem is, just like before when I said just say no, the $25 tables are loaded because people want to play the game, right? The casinos know this, right? They know we want to play. 
and no matter what limit they put, we're gonna they're gonna put people on the table. The thing you worry about is, you know, people like my son who don't have a bankroll to play at a twenty-five dollar table, having that as their only option. They're pushing them off to bubble craps or the roll to win, which is a shame because they're gonna miss out on the greatness of the game at a real table. It's too bad. But that's, I think, the reality. And the trend that we're seeing is more and more casinos going to higher and higher limits and fewer and fewer tables. And, you know, I don't know what we can do to stop that other than, you know, I guess maybe embrace it. Maybe if there's so many people playing at those tables, they need to, I I want more tables. I guess uh, what I'm saying is always I want more tables. I want them open. I want folks going to Dewar School and, and growing this thing. But at the $25 level, it's hard to play unless you've got a bankroll. Now, there are ways to play at a $25 table and make it feel like a $10 table. You can play a do we don't where one of the bets is $10 higher than the other. You can come through the don't come and then place the number that lands on for a little bit higher. And you can turn a $25 table into a $10 table. It's kind of a stroke for the dealers, but it's a way to kind of beat the system. They're not going to love you doing it, but it is what it is. So that, I think, is, is the trend that we're seeing that none of us probably like, but we're going to have to live with. My advice to you is this. Start working on strategies in your practice sessions, whether it's on your phone in an app, if it's in Windcrafts, if it's on your own table. Work on $25 strategies. If you don't have the bankroll, work on ways to turn $25 strategies into $10 strategies with some basic hedging. Or just work a little bit more on, you know, flat don't betting or flat pass line betting or some other mixture of bets that let you survive at that level of of minimum. If you've got a strategy that works for you at the $25 level, especially one that makes $25 feel like $10, let me know. Drop us a message at firesidecraps.com. I'd love to hear what your ideas are, what you're doing to play at the higher minimum tables and how are you adjusting to it how is your gameplay changed? What's your bankroll looking like? What are you doing differently than before? Leave us a message. I'd love to incorporate that into not only the, the podcast here, but also on the on the YouTube channel and roll out some strategies at that higher level that we all can kind of absorb into our regular normal bankroll. So anyway, that's what's trending in craps. Let's end this first episode with a happy little segment I like to call The World According to John. What I want to do in this segment is just talk about not necessarily gambling things, but more life things. And I may be able to tie it back a little bit. Today, in this episode, I want to talk about COVID. And you're probably thinking, oh my God, John's going to destroy himself by going political on the first podcast. I don't want to talk about COVID itself. I do want to talk about like this weird division that we've got and I'll roll it into craps here in a minute. You know, COVID for whatever reason, we've always been politically divided, right? There's always going to be conservatives and liberals in every country. There's always going to be religious division. There's, there's folks that are like me that are religious and there's also atheists. Fine. Until the last year or so, we've been able to get by by disagreeing or agreeing to disagree And being adult about it, COVID has thrown all that out the window. And we've turned into a bunch of assholes, frankly. Um, If you don't wear a mask, you're called a murderer. If you do wear a mask, you're called a sheep. People are losing respect for each other. And somehow we've given ourselves permission to just be, I don't want to say evil, but my God, what what are we doing? And it, it comes back to the craps table a little bit. And, you know... The, the right side versus the don't side. Okay, whatever. It's even worse when you talk about the dice controllers. There's dice controllers and there's people who don't think it's possible. Great. You don't think it's possible. But the level of anger and bile that I see in the chat rooms and in my comments on the YouTube channel is off the charts. I don't get it. It's like COVID has given us, like I said, permission to treat each other like subhumans, like garbage. And we're doing that here, too. And it's like, I don't understand why we're so divided. But I can tell you this. There's no place for it in the world. There sure is not any place for it at the craps table. You can't solve world hunger in eight minutes. But you can treat one person like the person they deserve to be treated. Everybody at the table with you 
is somebody's mom, somebody's dad, somebody's kid, somebody's husband, somebody's wife. They're humans that deserve respect. And I am too, and so are the people who are who are either teaching dice control or the folks that don't care about dice control or think it's impossible. You have a chance to treat somebody else like a human and not like a piece of garbage. And I'm seeing way, way, way too much of that. It's 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 frankly a little bit gross to me when I see that, and it's just a dirty feeling. I think we're better than that. I think as as craps players and as gamblers, yeah, we're in our little bubble, but even in that bubble, you can make a small difference. And I think my message here and what I want to close with is just that. Treat people with respect. Start eliminating the division. Find reasons to to talk, to debate, to agree to disagree, to hash it out without this, you know, hard line. Everything is not black and white. Everything is not binary. We can find ways to make it work. You just got to put the work in to make it work. And that's what I want to leave you with today. Put in the work to make things work and let's start improving the discourse. We can do it together. And that's about all I've got to say on the topic. I think, uh, I said, I think we're better. I think we're better and we can be better. And I hope that you'll you'll join me in being better. Well, that wraps up our first episode of Fireside Craps. I really, really appreciate your time. Thanks for downloading the episode and hanging out with us for the last hour or so. It's really a big deal. I'd love to see you at our website, firesidecraps.com. Leave me a message. Any feedback you've got about the episode, your great gambling stories, your $25 table strategies, ideas for the show, whatever it is, the microphone is yours. I'd love to have you there. Also hope to see you out at our YouTube channel. It's ProCraps. And maybe we'll see you out there at the tables. This is John. Thanks again for listening. We'll see you on the next episode.